Welcome to Comic Power. I am your host, Comic Killer 72. Welcome to the new segment called Get Your Popcorn Ready. And if you're wondering, get your popcorn ready is a phrase I borrowed from Terrell Owens, the former NFL player. When he signed a contract to play with the Dallas Cowboys, they asked him what he's going to do. And he said, get your popcorn ready because I'm going to put on a show. And I thought the name was fitting for the movies because that's what you're eating when you're watching them anyway. Our first ever review for this new segment is going to be Guardians of the Galaxy Part 2. First off, this is going to be a no spoiler review, so I'm not going to give you any specific plot points. I won't mention the name of any specific new character other than Mantis because she was shared with us in trailers released by the studio. So I will be insightful but yet generic if that's possible. In Guardians Part 2, we're reintroduced to the Guardians and they're fighting a big giant space monster and there's a funny intro credit with Baby Groot doing some dance moves as mayhem goes on behind him in the background. It establishes the mood of the film that's action packed and will be funny. Yandu and the Ravagers return and one of the chief Ravagers is played by a 1980s action movie star that you will recognize. This movie is heavily influenced by pop culture of the late 70s and 1980s. Some of the battle scenes use sounds that are influenced by 1980s video games and the soundtrack uses songs like Surrender by Cheap Trick. The movie has a intentional campiness that's over the top like a Looney Tunes bit. It does not take itself too seriously and that makes it even more funny. In one scene I'll never forget, Gamora uses a shoulder mounted weapon that's the size of a U-Haul truck. It would make Marvin the Martian proud. Nebula also returns and she is the sister of Gamora and they don't like each other so it's no secret that they will engage in battle. As mentioned, Mantis appears in this movie. She's a very obscure character that was introduced in the Avengers number 112 back in 1973. She can read people's feelings when she touches them and she was able to tell that Star-Lord had romantic and sexual love feelings for Gamora. Once again, that was not a spoiler because it was in the trailer. Mantis is also a servant of Star-Lord's father and we get a big reveal of who he is. And he is also played by a 1980s action star. Underneath all of the action and the hilarity, there's also a theme of family. You might fight, fuss, and bicker, but you can rely on each other when it really counts. That's what I took away from the movie. I want to stress again that this movie does not take itself too seriously, unlike Star Trek and Star Wars, which are space operas that may be too stoic and too serious. Guardians of the Galaxy, on the other hand, spoofs the genre and it spoofs itself. It's hard to make fun of Guardians of the Galaxy because it's too busy doing it itself. It's probably the funniest movie I've seen since Tropic Thunder in 2008. The film is two hours and 17 minutes, but it doesn't feel that long. It goes by pretty quickly. It's very well edited and it's some of the best CGI I have ever seen. I would describe this film as an escapist space action comedy fantasy and a damn good one. In some sad news, there's the death of a major supporting character. They take the time out to properly mourn this character without dampening the mood of the film though. And yes, Stan Lee does make a cameo in the movie and there's a major review about how he's able to appear in all of these movies that are in different universes and different franchises. There are several after credit scenes as well so make sure you stay to the very very end because we get a tease of who might be the villain in Guardians of the Galaxy Part 3. The Avengers Infinity Wars Part 1 and Part 2 are coming up so you might not get Part 3 of Guardians until 2020 but it'll be worth the wait just like Part 2 was. It's more than just the plot and the CGI that makes this story work. It's the chemistry of the actors is really there. Unlike the first two Thor movies where Chris Hemsworth and Natalie Portman just didn't work together. They're supposed to be romantically involved, but it feels forced, where all the relationships in the Guardians feel genuine. And let's face it, this is a franchise that will never end, sort of like the Fast and the Furious. When the original members get up there in age, then they can be advisors to a new team of Guardians. Think about it, Star-Lord was a scumbag thieving Ravager for over 20 years. With all of his womanizing, he may have a son out there somewhere. And they could introduce that character and say, Guardians of the Galaxy Part 6 or something. And Star-Lord's son is mad at him for not being in his life. And Star-Lord would be like, dude, I didn't know. To Marvel, you're welcome. I just gave you a great idea for a future movie. But before I go off on a tangent, let's get back to part two. I give it 4.5 out of five stars. The only five star comic book movies I ever saw were the Avengers part one and the Dark Knight. So I give Guardians a nearly perfect grade, but not completely perfect. I heavily recommend it. You'll have a good time and you'll laugh your butt off. If you already haven't done so, be sure to subscribe to this channel and give it a thumbs up and share these videos on social media so others can learn about the channel. This is Comic Killer 72 for Get Your Popcorn Ready with my review on Guardians of the Galaxy Part 2. Until next time, bye-bye. Thank you.